Okay, on the show today, we've got Samantha Skyring, who's the CEO and founder of Oryx Desert Salt. And um, we're going to be speaking about success and setbacks and differentiation, latest trends, and a whole bunch of um, questions that we have for her just to understand her journey. Hello and welcome, I'm Dylan Colstadt and this is episode 12 of the Ask DK show. So today on our guest we've got Samantha Skyring and we're here at her amazing new premises, Oryx Desert Salt. And um, so, so many things to ask you because I'm really passionate about your product and I'm passionate about your journey and very excited about being able to speak to you today. So Thank you for inviting me, it's so welcome. wonderful to have you here. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so just a couple of questions. So I, I want to ask you questions that I think our viewers would want to <laughs> ask you. And specifically, everybody out there who's ever wanted to be an entrepreneur, they look at your product. I mean, you're everywhere now. You're in Pick and Pay, you're in Woolworths, you're in the UK, you're like global. And um, so it's like as an ordinary consumer, you pick up the product and you think, who's behind this brand and how did it get here? So how did you start your entrepreneurial journey? How did you pick salt as a product I mean like to go from the big you know humble beginnings to like these amazing premises just maybe tell me that I'll do that so um, I think salt came to me <laughs> a friend was just uh, sending it exporting it to Germany and he didn't want to do the South African market and I had been using it and wanted to share it with my friends because it's so beautiful. Um, it's such an unrefined salt from a very special, beautiful place in a very remote uh, salt pan up in the Kalahari Desert. So I thought, okay, well, I'll take the South African market. So in the beginning, I saw it on every restaurant table. So I kind of had the vision quite quickly of it um, being available. Um, and and being on restaurant tables, that was the one one aspect that I I, I followed up on from the beginning. Um, but I think the entrepreneurial journey has actually been part of who I am from a very very young age. Um, Thirteen, I started uh, working. Actually, my parents had a financial. Um, crash and lost their business mm -hmm. um, and so that actually just gave me the impetus of just get out and go do it mm -hmm. um, and in fact up until five years ago I hadn't been salary salaried for 17 years wow. so I've gone from various projects um, and various businesses and so had you experienced failure before had you had you like had this amazing dream and, and like lost it all I mean like did I you had. always have all these successful businesses behind you like no um, so the one was an amazing business that was in tourism and unfortunately I had partners um, who decided they wanted it all um, and they managed to use the legal kind of scenario to get us out mm -hmm. um, it was yeah it was quite devastating I was 22 I didn't know how to handle it and didn't know how to be strong in fact what was very interesting for me was I didn't have the conviction to say this is what I want mm -hmm. and what's interesting is um, so I did Oryx Salt for a year and then I got my first business partner in um, and we, would, we had a year's journey together and we still weren't profitable after that second year, which I wasn't actually expecting. I mean, I had the thousand days in mind, um, but he didn't um, come to me and sit me down and say, I'm feeling concerned. I got a lawyer's letter, oh. um, which was a bit of a shock and out of the blue, um, but that was, that was the way he, only way he could deal with it. But what was interesting was 22 years later, I was like, no, actually, I'm doing this oh, wow. so that gave me the conviction so I oh, then wow. suddenly felt this courage and this conviction in the fire to go so if you had no I'm had, doing this if you hadn't been screwed over in a way before, mm. maybe you wouldn't have had the, mm. the mm. lesson and the learning and the courage mm. and the know-how mm. to stand up to for what stand up mm -hmm. for yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. amazing yeah, yeah I've, interesting I've, 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 for many years I've always looked at you know my failures and my hardships and my struggles and my trials as like 
shame and but it's only recently because as I become older and wiser <laughs> that I've realized they were lessons mm. they were lessons I, I I worked with that horrible cow you know who you are <laughs> and uh, I worked with that horrible cow because she had to teach me because mm. I, I needed I had so many rough edges that needed wearing off and I and I and I was partnered with this terrible person because I had to l learn how to grow a spine and and mm. and a pear and, you know <laughs> absolutely it's <laughs> so true that's exciting okay mm -hmm. so um how did you um so okay so let me just see now hmm. i mean i can speak more on that if you want me yeah, to yeah. a little bit yeah. um so the other for me power and passion has actually come there are three things that i put it down to one is being over 40 love ah. being over 40. <laughs> I, totally. I can't wait to be over 40 one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm over 40. <laughs> That's true. No, being over 40 rocks. Definitely. Yeah. And being a mum, yeah. having that responsibility yeah. and mm. suddenly realising I'm responsible for another human being. Mm. And being a single mum has oh. been very powerful. Yeah. Not having a support and just needing to make it happen. Wow. Um, and then also, in fact, when um, that first partner decided that he didn't want to be part of it, I realized, wow, you know, I've actually really only been working very hard for two years of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, but maybe I'm going to live to 84. That means mm -hmm. I've got 42 years. I'm definitely giving my age away. Mm -hmm. um, 42 mm -hmm. years left to live, and I want to live a beautiful standard of living, and yeah. I really want to live. And I was like, gee, that's, um, that's a long time. I need to... It was the first time that it really sunk in, that I've got to take care of myself for a long time and how am I going to do that? How, what is my financial vehicle going to be? Mm. And so I really put the commitment in to Oryx and uh, to say that this is my, this is my financial vehicle. This is your investment. Um, this is my investment. Yeah. Um, so in, I think having, having a kid forces you to be responsible mm. and not just like, oh, okay, fine, screw Float it. Float around. <laughs> yeah, because you have totally. to pay for school fees and you have to pay for You've got these monthly university. expenses um, and you kind of plan ahead a little bit more. I mean, I knew that I wanted him to go to a certain school yeah. and it was not negotiable. He yeah. was going to go to Waldorf school, actually, mm. um, and mainstream wasn't an option for me. Mm. So I knew that I needed to make the money to be able to afford that. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so in the, very, in the very beginning, like, okay, so find someone came to you with a product, mm -hmm. um, but how did you, like what? What was the first things that you did? How did you get sales? What did you, how did you actually knock on doors and get people to stock your product? What, what have you done to? Okay. So I... Who was your first customer? Okay. So I, I actually started packing the product on my dining room table. Wow. So it was literally had a like a, a tub. A bag of salt. A bag of salt <laughs> and <laughs> poured it in and checked it and sifted through it to make sure there were no pieces and, and, and packed the cotton bags myself. And you came up with the brand yourself? Where did the brand Yeah, the brand, oh, so the brand, um, in 2000 when I had no child and I had time and money, <laughs> huh, really? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> um, I did a very beautiful five month journey um, with friends to Namibia okay. and I ended up doing a seven day walk through the Namib Desert, wow. 120 kilometers. We hadn't wow. ever got to the Skeleton Coast so we decided to walk there. Wow. Um, and I had close encounters with the Oryx Wow. Um, and so they became a very powerful and special memory for me of oh, that wow. journey. And so when I was offered this product from the Kalahari, that was this beautiful image because they were standing three meters in front of me. This masked face and these tall horns beautiful. was um, was the imagery that came okay. up. Um, but it when it, it has actually changed. I knew nothing about packaging or product or logos or anything so it's really been a learning curve yeah. um, and it felt like it took up too much space in the front I felt like I needed to share that it was unrefined and unprocessed and from an ancient source and no additives and sun-dried and so I had all that info and sustainable and it had all of that information mm. on the front of the the bag yeah. and we were gifted actually after my partners have been with me currently for four years as just after we partnered, a mutual friend of ours said, I can do something with that brand. But the interesting thing was this logo was actually the very first little uh, pencil diagram that I drew oh, wow. 
but I ended up changing it to a sort of a, a side view that took up less space on, on, on the packaging. Okay. So, but it felt like this was meant to be. Yes. I just needed strong partners in order yeah. to help me hold to it to and it to, to make yeah. it happen. Lovely. So it went through a little bit of a foundational period and then we, and then it uh, yeah. came into its own. Yes. Mm. So you're on the dining room table and you're packing it, mm -hmm. the product yourself? Mm. And I hit the road. I was... Um, yeah, I just started knocking on doors. I mean, I had an interesting experience because I, I actually left uh, an abusive relationship in Denmark. And so I came back with my little three-year-old and I really just had to make it happen. And I um, was staying in a little wooden Wendy house, very, very small. Um, and I didn't have much money either. And I remember this w few days where I was... Uh, I think I was having panic attacks. <laughs> I was battling to breathe. <laughs> Didn't have much money. <laughs> I had no airtime. I had no petrol. Uh -huh. And there was one restaurant actually that I'd visited a few times. Yeah. And they phoned me up and they were like, right, we want 24 grinders of each. Yeah. It was about 575 rand. And yeah. it just, I was like, I can do this. This, this can work. Oh, yeah. um, so that was my first restaurant. And my first um, retail was a beautiful shop in Komiki on the main road called Rogers Fruiterers. Oh, no and a lovely Asian lady by the name of Merle. And um, having traveled in India, I love, you know, when you go to a shop, if you're the first customer in the morning, you are their blessing oh, for the day. Yeah. Um, and Merle just felt like my blessing. Oh, she wow. gave me a couple of names of why didn't you go here and there. And um, so the product, it actually went on consignment, which wasn't a good idea. Um, learned <laughs> in retrospect, consignment does not work. Um, so, so now you get them to buy it from you? Yes. Yeah. Why does consignment not work? Because I know a lot of startup um, mm -hmm. retailers, uh, you know, people in the retail mm. space, startup entrepreneurs, they, mm. consignment's the only mm. thing they know. I mean, I guess it, 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 it does get the product out on shelf. And my thought was, I'd rather it to be sitting on a shop shelf, mm. getting, having views. sales and yeah. getting views rather than sitting in my warehouse. But when a shop doesn't take ownership of a, of a product because they haven't paid for it, oh. There's something that just, they, they don't value it as much. The they energy. don't, yeah, it's... Um, I understand. Mm. Mm. And yet I was coming from a place of, I need you. So yes. if you're going to put it on your shelf, then... But the, the, the recon of it just always ends up being a mess. So um, when did you have the confidence to switch to, no, you must buy it? Probably a couple of years down the line. Wow. Um, so you, you mm, did on consignment for a couple mm, of years mm, and then you switched mm, to, no, actually yes. buy it up front. And yes. did you find that people said no because they did did you find people said yes because they knew you and that people said no because they didn't know you, if they didn't know you so like a new prospective client would they say no to that or was it sort of a confidence thing that you felt that now you yeah I, felt I, I had been yeah and I had been burnt I'm mm. in fact I am a, a rep decided to go on his own and become a distributor and so he took a whole lot of stock and he was giving out it out as consignment oh, no. and then he didn't pay me oh, no. so it was like okay just that was that was really the final like, and it's not like do that. a services industry where okay fine it's just hours and at the end of the day okay fine it's salaries but you know it's, you've got hard costs in each mm. product mm. Mm. absolutely so I mean I guess it so it does work for that initial period but there's a point where there is that value like mm. I value my product if you want the product mm. then let's do that exchange it is going to sell um, so, yeah. Okay. Just something so that does change along the way, I think. Your confidence. Mm. Confidence in yourself and in mm. your product. And also realizing the cash flow um, and, and having limited time. So to have to follow up on those people mm. to make those little payments of stock that has sold just ends up being time consuming and a bit stressful, yeah. like product, running all after. And cash is tied up in consignment stock as opposed to... Mm stock that's actually shifted mm -hmm. and how did you get into the big retailers because I think a lot of smaller entrepreneurs are very intimidated calling up a Woolworths or a pick and pay like mm. what was your journey there and and also I've heard some horror stories of some of the bigger retailers they're quite hard on their on their mm. uh, on their suppliers especially their small guys you mm -hmm. can just like I think lose your shirt 
there have been those stories. Um, I think I've had a very beautiful and a very um, graceful journey actually into retail. Mm. Um, my strategy was to stay in the speciality in the smaller deli and butcher shops and so on, mm -hmm. Patstalikis, um, in order to get the brand out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was very important, together with the restaurants. If I'd gone directly onto retail shelf, I wouldn't have moved. Whereas now, after five, it took oh. us five years to go into retail. So, so you first built up the brand nationally mm -hmm. through small retailers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Independence. Independence. Mm. Okay, so that when you went on shelves, there was already some recognition. Mm -hmm. So there was recognition coming from people eating at restaurants and seeing your, mm -hmm. your product on the tables. Mm. And okay, okay. And then when you went into na national, so, so would your advice be to do the same thing or to, to, to push for national? I mean, if you could do things differently now, do you think that? I don't think I would do it differently. Hmm. Um, I mean, the, the retail, also, I can't, um, I would never have been able to do five years ago what I do now, like the, the, the managing capacity of the product. Retail is hard okay. and it, there's a lot of, um, admin around it you know being on the edi and the portal and a business is a bit like a child mm -hmm. so if you're given a seven year old or 11 year old who's got all yeah. their idiosyncrasies and their habits yeah. and their likes and their dislikes yeah. um you know yeah, you, you don't know that so mm -hmm. you know with a baby you grow and you get to know them so a mm -hmm. business is like that so you and first learned you, you practiced on mm, the smaller retailers mm. And, and getting your systems, operations, mm -hmm. your returns, your mm -hmm. your stock control, all of that stuff in mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. so that when you went to the bigger guys, you were already all. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, if 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 one's starting in the industry, that one doesn't know mm -hmm. to try and play big, doesn't. Um, I, I'd imagine one can get one's fingers very very so burnt. Could you survive on on your business? At what point could you, like? earn a bit of a salary did it take you like six months before you could like how were you surviving because you literally mm. were like mm. you desperate for money so you it needed to have been paying for itself at some point yes um i was fortunate in that i did have a house that had been on the market um wow. and i sold it not not very wisely i didn't do very well out of it but it did give me a little bit of a lump sum okay. and so i was using that app and okay. putting it into stock mm -hmm. but i was very aware of it um and it wasn't very much it was about 150,000 rand Whoa. um yeah so it was minimal you're probably kicking yourself now thinking what that house is worth or what you could sell it for now yes don't think like that. no yes and no i mean it was it was a stepping stone to what i've got yeah. here i it mean it's in the ground. yeah what totally exactly yeah so uh, it was my investment into something much bigger mm -hmm. which is even more than what a house really will be in mm -hmm. in the long term mm -hmm. so because this is a residual income that will yes. just keep coming in whereas yeah. a house is a once off buy and a sell True. um so i think i forgot your question <laughs> So you could, you, you used oh, yes, that, okay. you a very small runway, like it yes. wasn't going to last for, mm. so. So after, it was already in that first year that I realized I needed to start putting in a, creating a business plan mm -hmm. and finding somebody to invest. Okay. Um, and. Was that when you brought in the first investor? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that. So Getting funding, because that's always an, the, the next question for entrepreneurs mm, is, mm. you know, getting funding. So mm. what I love about what you did is a lot of people want to first get funding and you already had a, a year long business that was mm. operating. You had clients, you were making mm. trades, if not money, you were make, you know, you was money coming there in, was money going out, flow. there was mm. capital flow. Um, how did you, f how did you pick your next, how did you pick your investor? How do you find an investor? Mm, I was quite fortunate he, he's in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to just go um, introduce my product and he and I mentioned in the first discussion that we were that I was putting together the business plan and he said, please offer, offer it to me. Okay. So that was a real blessing. I didn't yeah. have to. There wasn't a major look. Yeah. Um, do but you regret now that you didn't shop around for more options? No, definitely not. So he was he was amazing. He was a good fit at that mm, time. You were absolutely. Happy. And he also came from a corporate structure, so in fact he used his staff to 
get uh, Rx be to be to be a proper PTY limited. Okay. I got my export license. I became VAT um, okay. registered. registered, and up until the point that he got involved, I was still operating out of one bank account, mm -hmm. and there was no separation between Rx and my personal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think yeah. that can be. Um, that can be dangerous and messy, mm. definitely. Yeah, I also had that. <laughs> <laughs> splitting of everything. And, and, and it's a real profit. step up that. Mm. Um, and I think it can happen I even inside where you can have two bank accounts where you end up paying yourself a little salary or an amount that you live off. But with this cash flow coming in and me just spending it, and I know there were a couple of things where... <laughs> I was not watching my pennies. <laughs> um, that uh, you know, one doesn't see the difference where it, whether it's making a profit or not, and where yeah, you're yeah. actually losing yeah. because there is this flow coming in. But your expenses and the yeah. business expenses are two you know very separate things. Yeah. Yeah. So no, he was. It was perfect. Um, and and even in fact the the fact that he wanted out and the two mm. beautiful business partners that I have now mm. um, was How also did you a blessing. Ah, oh, there was an, uh, another blessing. <laughs> <laughs> so many blessings. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> um, I really believe very strongly in intention. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I use. In fact, if if any, anyone was to ask me how I've built Rx, I would say I've built it on gratitude. Oh. Um, How is gratitude and intention? Um, I I know, I know you've, you, you mentioned visualizing mm -hmm. early, very early. Mm -hmm. You said you visualized its success, mm -hmm. and now you mentioned gratitude and intention. Now, mm. these may sound like sort of airy fairy concepts, but so many people that are successful, businessmen, businesswomen all over the world, mention these words. Mm. So, like, practically speaking, mm. Can you talk me through visualizing intention and gratitude? Like, what are okay. they practically? Um, so, I mean, the intention was I, I, I want an investor. I want someone to come in with money. I believe in my product. I believe in, the, in how it's going to grow. And just being absolutely having the conviction. So, did you know how much you wanted, the kind of investor you wanted, how much percentage you wanted to give away? Did you have those numbers in your head? No. Or was it just like, okay, I'm ready for investment? Yes. I'm open. Yes. Okay. Um, that's right. Okay. Um, and then the gratitude, I think, I mean, gratitude's been part of my life for um, as far back as I can remember, just being really grateful. Even the beautiful little wooden Wendy house that I ended up finding when I first arrived and I was um, on, a, on a sort of organic permaculture farm and it was this tiny little spot had this beautiful view of the mountain. Wow. And it was, you know, it was miniature, but it was a safe space and I appreciated and had gratitude for this mm. safe space that I was in. Mm. Um, and as the growth happened, I mean, when I moved into a home, into a little cottage that had walls <laughs> and I had a toilet inside, I didn't have to walk across the, the driveway to get to the loo in the rain in the winter. Um, I, I really appreciated and, mm. and, and was grateful for mm. the growth that I now had. And in fact, what when my first partner got involved, I, I then got into a salary. And as I mentioned earlier, it was the first salary that I'd got in 17 years. And it was like, wow, amazing. Now I'm getting this constant amount of money that I know that I can budget mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, so paying for school fees and paying for rent and, and so on. So always being appreciative of your, being appreciative of growth and your journey mm. and moving from bad to, work to better mm. and then so that's gratitude and then intention, like always setting an intention of this is what I want. Mm. Um. So, yes. Yeah, so when when he came with uh, the first partner came with the uh, the exit letter, <laughs> um, the intention was to find someone who would buy him out and there was no if but maybe that I would find them. Yeah. Um, I just knew that, I, I, I mean, I networked up a storm. Yeah. I just, it was quite phenomenal how many people I met in that period of time. Mm. And yet what was interesting, I had booked a Vipassana. Do you know, it's a 10 day silent meditation. Oh, it's a divine. 10 day silent retreat. And I booked that in the January. And I was actually in a process of due diligence and financials for um, a potential investor. Um, but they ended up being more corporate than they'd kind of um, given on to initially. 
and it was while they were doing the financials that I went off to the re retreat and I was staying in a little cottage and there were four women and there was one, um, one of them, Pippa, who I thought I knew from childhood. She looked so familiar. Yeah. You know, we'd never met before. <laughs> <laughs> she was Cape Town and I was Joburg. And uh, she told me about her husband um, and his brother who were setting up a business to invest in small businesses. Mm. Um, and they became my partners. Wow. Um, so yeah, uh, that was a, a very, uh, I mean, a very beautiful way of mm. meeting him. Mm. Um, and, that, and, and the other company that were going to get involved strung me along for five months and eventually wanted 80% shares. And I was like, oh fortunately I still had this like strong belief in the product and I was like, no. 80%? And I, 80%. What kind of investor takes a, a, an entrepreneur's passion and what is it down to the point where they're going to lose their focus and they fire and become an employee become an employee i mean and and sucks the i mean that is not a, a partner that you can actually no, absolutely not. that's why they the exactly that's too. why i realize they were more corporate than mm. the family business that they made yeah. out to be initially no. because I don't think, and so, so currently I, I am on a 50-50% shareholding yeah. um, and in fact the first partner wanted 51% and wanted me to have 49% yeah. and I was, I mean for me that wasn't going to work because yeah. I knew immediately then there was, there was a disparity in energy yes. and, and yes. it's not balanced yeah. and an advisor, a lovely mentor that I met in that networking period gave me beautiful advice that you know, if you needed to use the 51%, so even if I had 51% and someone else had 49, mm -hmm. um, then you've lost the relationship anyways exactly. and a partnership is finding solutions and working through mm -hmm. whatever like it is you need to work through to mm -hmm. find, you know, to find the common vision and to find a solution together, mm -hmm. not to use your 1% power to yes. step on or make yes. a decision. Yeah. So, um, and then visualization. So you, you spoke in the beginning about visualizing and that, is it something that you practice a lot or is it, because I've actually started now, I know all the successful entrepreneurs and we're talking like mega successful, they have a very um, specific morning routine that I'm trying to get into. So I'm not yet at four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but I have started getting up earlier and I do 20 minutes of exercise. I mean, eventually this is all gonna become like an hour of exercise and an hour of meditation and visualization and <laughs> prayer and planning the day. And mm -hmm. um, mm. do, you, do you do any of that? I have stages of doing <laughs> morning, morning sessions and then, but yeah, I'm not really good. I often pick up my computer as my morning just to get on top Check of the work out. that needs to be done. Yeah, <laughs> not ideal, but I mean, after the meditation, I did, I meditated for a while. Mm. And at the beginning of this year, I actually took my team on a, on a breathing course. Oh, nice. um, so for three months, I was waking up every morning and doing my breathing and then that Bell by the wayside. <laughs> um, so yeah. there's a there's a beautiful man, uh, Michael Beckwith. He's um, in the States. Uh, he was actually part of that that movie, The Secret. Um, but I loved the one thing that he said is, uh, we don't suffer from ADHD. We suffer from IDHD, intention deficit disorder, oh. which I think is really powerful because we, and especially in this day and oh. age. Our attention gets grabbed by our phone, our computer, just like constantly we're reacting. Yes. Yeah. Um, but we don't spend enough time in like deciding what it is that we want. And I think... Yeah, it's so true. Mm. I, I know one of the hardest questions I asked myself when I was retrenched from the company I was working at and when I had this opportunity to go on my own for the first time, I really battled with the question, what do I want? Mm. It was the hardest question I'd ever ever faced in my whole life mm. what do I want mm. so um, so I find that now every morning when I wake up I like what do I want and then I intentionally state this month this is what I want these are the number Amazing. of sales that I want this is the profit that I want Wow um, awesome! because the other thing that I realized was I was setting these great goals of I want to be earning this much by December but I hadn't actually done the homework to say, okay, if I want to earn this much, how many sales is that? Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> okay, how many quotes is that? Okay, and how many meetings is that? Okay, how many phone calls is that? 
mm-hmm, and emails mm-hmm. to get the to see if it was realistic to get the quotes out to get the sales out <coughs> to, you know what I mean so mm-hmm. um, so I do think that intention is a beautiful thing visualization is a beautiful thing and then and then then you sit and you plan your day okay how do I how do I get to what do I have to do today to help me achieve what I just visualized what one or two things am I going to do today to get to what I just visualized? I think that's one way. I, I, I tend to not do that <laughs> way. <laughs> that is where we're trying to. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th- I think I've heard once the universe doesn't, doesn't, isn't interested in the how or, or the, yeah, the how, the detail. You've just got to know what it is. <laughs> I yeah. kind of hang on to the what. Yeah, I think it has just been this journey of knowing that this is my financial vehicle. I have a big reason, my son, mm. um, and, exci- and, 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 and loving my product and being just excited to get it out into the world. Um, and knowing that it is a, that that I have the ability to do it, that I actually have the belief in myself, and 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 coupled with this beautiful product, that it will happen. Mm. Um, and so your milestones were okay. So year one, you 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 brought on an investor, so you you'd gotten into a whole bunch of um, small retail re- retailers, and then. Um, uh, you brought on a y- an investor that stayed a year. How long mm-hmm. did they stay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you brought on your your two your two your partner investors, the two brothers, and they've been with you now. And so, like your milestones into so then you then you got into Woolworths and you got into Pick and Pay, and now you're going global. So, how do you what how do you like what's your next big idea and what's your next big focus and and how are you going to achieve that well i think you've you've just made me realize that my spaces have been very um parallel in the growth so initially um i had a beautiful packing warehouse called ukama who are now next door to us mm. um and they had a, a warehouse and initially they packed the product and then they left it i had just two pallets oh, of wow. stock and they would send, I would send in the orders and they would put it together and they would send it out and charge me a fee on, on the courier and, and the handling fee. Okay. And then after a year, I, they moved to a bigger warehouse and so I envisioned a space in the warehouse that was my own, okay. which is what happened. We were two flights up in a little windy spiral staircase that we had to carry stock up and down. Right. And, but it was, I mean, it was probably, you know, just a, a small, yeah, probably about a garage size, maybe yeah. a little bit bigger. And, and then I could feel that, well, it wasn't after a year, it wasn't working out to carry salt up and down. Mm-hmm. And, and that at that point, or just before, um, my partners Ian and Garth got involved and I knew that I needed a bigger space. I could mm-hmm. feel the growth mm-hmm. and I knew that I needed a space to grow into and I needed a ground floor. Okay. So we then got our first real warehouse, um, which was around the corner from where we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was 135 square meters and we were in there for four years. Um, And and we were driving stock to a karma, um, just a couple of hundred meters, but we had to put stock in and then drive it and what have you. And and then then Janine and I envisioned working together more mm. strongly. I love her ethos and her values. She really supports the community and mm. feeds a beautiful creche every day wow. and does amazing work in the community. And uh, we give back uh, a percentage to uh, the sand bushman up in the Kalahari based oh, on wow. sales. Okay. And we've also got a very strong community support. There's a little mm. township project that makes our little cotton bags now. Oh, no. Um, and it's packed by Okama, which is this micro enterprise packing house. And, um, and then we've now moved into this warehouse recently, only three weeks ago. And um, it's a 500 square meter warehouse. Wow. And I wasn't enjoying going into the previous one. And I realized when we moved in here that we were so cramped. Like we mm. literally, we had these little pathways between the stock and the product and mm. the bags. And we had outgrown it. Mm. And this space now for me is so exciting because mm. you can't grow if you don't have a space to, to expand. Yes, that's true. So, and I know now we've got a lot of vertical space. We won't need to move mm. here for, for at least five years, I'd yeah. imagine. Yeah. Um, but I felt like we had, we could, I couldn't grow if there wasn't the space to grow. 
Mm -hmm. um, so the timing for this has been perfect. In yeah. fact, our first very big order, first very, very, very big order is going off to the UK to Sainsbury's today or tomorrow. Sainsbury's. This is it and all the way down yeah, it's there. It's mm. going to fly off the shelf. <laughs> You're going to be part of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, um, and in fact, I mean, this now has come in two weeks after moving into the space. So the timing has been so beautiful, such amazing, beautiful flow. Huh? Yeah. The right thing, you meet the right person, the right mm. thing just all, I don't know, mm. just divinely happens. Mm. And that happens together. from gratitude, I believe. Mm. I really believe just giving thanks all the time for yeah. all the little things. Then it just, the flow, it allows for flow. But you're also working really hard. I'm working very hard. <laughs> I am. So. <laughs> that helps too. That helps too. <laughs> so, um, have you ever been like absolutely terrified? Like you lost track of your spending and it looked like you were going to go under and lose it all? Um, or, yeah, you know, I mean... Something just went like horribly wrong well, or when someone returned a huge batch and... When the first partner wanted out was quite... Your big. Whew, yeah, they're terrifying. Yeah. Um, thinking that I could have lost two years of hard work. Yeah. Um, but not allowing myself to get trapped in that fear, rather just being very, very proactive mm -hmm. in, um, in finding a solution. Yeah, and then, my, and then my, my rep that went on his own and didn't pay like 40 or 50,000 rand. Wow. Um, but besides, so yeah, it was a lot. Um, in, yeah, so, but besides that, I haven't had any major crises. Mm. Um, no. Just a small everyday. Sainsbury's order. Have you seen those barcodes? Mm -hmm. Those aren't right. <laughs> and the order was supposed to leave today and suddenly I, I was away for the last two weeks in Germany. Got back yesterday, looked at the barcodes, realised this stock is going to get rejected at DC in the UK. And then just having to make it happen very quickly. So you still can't let go and let the business uh -uh. run by itself? No, not I yet. I mean, if you can sit and look at a barcode and know that a barcode's wrong, uh -huh. then... Mm. So are you, are you looking at any point to, um, how dependent is the business on you? Because I think also as entrepreneurs, we become, you know, there's something called mm. entrepreneur's disease where we don't want a business to succeed without us. So then there's this mm. like actually slightly toxic, poisonous, secret mindset that some entrepreneurs mm. have where they'll almost poison their businesses themselves. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen this happen hmm. where um, it can't succeed without me. And they, you know, because they always want to be the hero coming along and saving the day. Mm. So that's something I'm so aware of in myself. Like, am I empowering my team? You know, like how much of the business is dependent on me? So how much of the business is you? And how much can we pull you away and will the business still survive? Or is there, is it all just like resting on you like that? No, I mean, I've had an awesome, we had a big fight this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Should pick up the office. <laughs> Always forgiven me, not. <laughs> um, who's been with me for four years, and they've also grown with the business. Okay. So, I mean, I can leave for two weeks, and he pretty much handles, yeah. but it's training him to have the eye in the detail. Okay. Um, so, the detail is so important. Yeah. Um, and that's and the stuff you've learned through doing it yourself for mm, all this time. Mm, mm. So, the business is only five years old? Seven, actually, from the very beginning, okay. seven years, yeah. Seven years, and that's amazing that you've taken it so far. And so you're you're going to conquer the UK this year, and um, and so that will be tick. And <laughs> like, how are you going to get into other countries? What's next for you? Um, so I attend uh, shows, um, international food shows. Um, so I'm just constantly plugging away to any interest that comes my way. Yeah. Um, plus I've got agents who do represent the product okay. internationally. Um, so in fact, this month we go to Saudi Arabia, we go to wow. South Korea, um, another shipment to Germany, and I've just got back from a show and Russia's interested in the wow. Netherlands. Um, so we've in, in fact, we've exported to 25 countries, wow. but probably only half are repeat orders. Okay. Um, and so have you ever... Um, it, the UK felt more manageable. Yes. Um, same time zone, same culture. Yes, exactly. And um, so I've targeted on the UK, and UK feels now it's it's solid, mm -hmm. and got a got a good foundation and base. Um, I've got a very beautiful South Af ex South African, um, whom 
randomly sent me an email. Hi, I've discovered Oryx and I want to sell it in the market in the UK. Sure, what's your number? <laughs> so he's full time on Oryx. Yeah. Um, he wanted to be out of his industry. And, and now my, my focus is slowly shifting towards the US. Okay. Um, so I'm just actually in the process of paperwork and FDA and making sure all my ducks are in a row. Mm. And we're going to send product to Amazon um, mm. as an initial and then try and work this is where you'll come in again <laughs> in the social media to get yeah. some hype and some talk and to just get it known in the US. And then we'll see, we'll see what we'll see how that grows. But if I can crack that market, then we'll be very happy. Amazing. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Mm. Um, I think that's we're going to call it a day there. We're going to wrap it because I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you've got Sainsbury's orders to get out. <laughs> Barcode. I'll be sitting here <laughs> putting stickers on. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you, Sam. Oh, You're thank amazing. You. And you I'm, too. I don't want to sound patron. I've been so proud of you. You've done such an amazing job. I mean, to still be a single mom and 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 have this huge baby, and this has grown to like a nice young teenager, or more like a <laughs> yeah. preemie. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> but there's still such an exciting journey ahead, and every mm. day you're learning and problem solving and growing. Mm. And I think. Um, what I've learned as an entrepreneur is your business is as big as you are on the inside. So mm. as you grow and face your challenges and overcome mm. them. And mm. I think just to wrap up, um, the personal growth is so integral to growing a business. Mm. Um, I mean, I've listened to hours of business audios mm. and, and um, other or personal growth audios. Um, and I've done, I've done a lot of work in that. Okay. Um, that I don't, don't believe I would have been able to achieve what I have to date without doing that work and, mm. putting, and putting in the time. It's so, so. interesting you say that because um, I've also jo I've joined this book club forcing me to read business books, which mm. I never would have read mm -hmm. myself. And I agree with you, learning mm. the clever thoughts of mm. clever successful people, mm -hmm. it just shortcuts things exactly. a lot. Yeah. It really does. Mm. Yeah, so there's a lo yeah. lot of information and beautiful mentors and people out there and we've got access to the internet. We can, the, know. you know, we can YouTube all sorts of people that's and ask so questions. True. So, so that's, that's, that's a must. Yeah, Absolutely. it's so true. Invest in yourself, not mm -hmm. in watching TV series. Oh, totally, no. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Cool. I just want to thank Yay. you. Thank you guys for watching. Um, Yay. And, thank um, you so yeah, much. That's a wrap for episode 12. And um, stay thank in touch. And please go and buy some Oryx salt. Quickly plug your salt. Tell me why it's better than Himalayan. Okay. Oh, I haven't even really told you about the salt. <laughs> so it comes from a very beautiful salt pan, just short of um, 50 kilometers south of Botswana. Uh, 250 kilometers north of Uppington. So there's a beautiful 50 square kilometer salt pan and they discovered underground a 55 million ton salt lake. Wow. Wow. It's fed also by underground rivers, so it's renewable and sustainable. And the rivers flow through rock strata that have been geoscientifically tested at 300 million years old. So it really wow. is an ancient pure source. And the whole area is uninhabitable, so there's no pollution, there's no contamination. And we pump up this brine, it's 100% saturated, so it crystallizes into pure white crystals in four weeks. Wow. We add no chemicals, and it's still got all the beautiful vital minerals and trace elements that salt is supposed to have. So it really is salt. A lot of products on the shelf now, they call it salt, but it's industrial salt, and it's had all the goodness stripped out, and they've added chemicals, so it flows freely, um, but actually salt's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to absorb moisture, which allows our bodies to be hydrated. And, uh, and our grinders have a ceramic mechanism, so they're 10 times refillable. Um, so we try and make the products as renewable and sustainable as possible because the, the source is. Mm. Um, and it's we not dynamited. It's not, no. Um, and we are 70% saline solution. Our tears, our blood, we need to replace with beautiful unrefined salt. Yeah. And cool. here we have from our beautiful Kalahari. I love it. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much. Go and buy some salt. <laughs> <laughs>